I want to welcome all the members who are logged in. I think we can start. Uh, today's session will be an interactive one. The topic, as we sent it out, is uh, uh, the evolution of sports law. Understanding the emerging areas of practice, we have uh, we have three panelists. My co-moderator is a bit held up; she couldn't be in on time. But we have three panelists who are renowned sports lawyers and practitioners. Among them is a judge. I'll start in that order. I'll introduce Senior Counsel John O'Haga who is a judge on the Sports Dispute tri Tribunal in Kenya. If you're online, Senior Counsel, are you online? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. All right, Senior Counsel is, uh, is a judge of the Sports Tribunal in Kenya. He, he, he's on record to say that he has sports in his DNA because he played sports all through until he realized the need to to actively get involved in sports law. He'll be taking us through several areas of uh, practice, arbitration, dispute settlement, uh, and giving his perspective from the point of being a judge, how sports law has evolved, what kind of, of uh, matters he receives and handles, he has had very good judgments recently, so we shall be hearing from him. We also have on panel Dev Pama. I hope he's also online. All right, he's always available with his Ronaldo 7 in the background. Happy to see you again. We last had a session Great in December. I'm happy to see you again. Uh, Dev is the He's an international sports lawyer. He's a director of Parma Sports. He's a CAS practitioner and advisor. He has dealt and advised on so many sports law and sports law contracts and uh, transactions. He has a wealth of experience in this area. And I believe he's doing, are you still doing work in uh, TZ Future? Is it Future Sports Africa? Yes, we still we still advise them. I sit on the advisory board myself. So indeed, yeah, you're correct. Yes, it's critical. Good research, for members Philip. To know, it's critical for members to know that uh, there is work going on. Sports law is not just a new area. So you'll be taking us through different areas like commercialization of sports um, and so many areas. Agency, there's a question on uh, on intermediaries that people are grappling with. Uh, we also have uh, on panel Ruta Ian, who is the legal secretary of uh, Anti Doping Kenya. I hope he's on on call. I am. I'm here. All right. Nice to meet you, Ruta. No uh, very passionate about sports dispute and having a clean sport environment. Uh, you'll be letting members know what is happening in anti-doping, uh, what are the opportunities in anti-doping, and uh, how people can tap in, because it's, it's also a sector of sports law that people most times think is for doctors or people who are qualified as medics, but people will be glad to know what is happening. For instance, at uh, Anti-Doping Kenya, I know there are a, a whole lot of, of courses that members can take on to develop their skills in, in sports law. So we shall start the panel with hearing from uh, the discussion from hearing from uh, senior counsel, John O'Haga, what he has prepared for us and what he has to present. Senior counsel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. <laughs> um, and um, it's nice to be on this panel with, with you, Dave, and uh, with you, Ian. I hope we can have a discussive uh, engagement. Um, so I, rather than present, I just want to speak briefly about um, um, sports law in Kenya. Um, Kenya's uh, place in 
in, in the world of the sporting nation, the, um, the basis for the establishment of a sports tribunal uh, and the fact that Kenya is unique uh, globally for having a statutory sports tribunal. Um, I, I think uh, in the UK and in Australia and other jurisdictions, they have arbitral um, bodies or you, as a sports person, you can go to arbitration. Uh, but Kenya does have a statutory tribunal which is set up um, under the Sports Act. <clears throat> and essentially, the first thing I think I always start out by saying is that in terms of igniting passions and in terms of um, attracting viewership, spectator, following, uh, sports is only second to religion and politics. Um, religion and politics, I think, uh, seem to me to be at par. Uh, but sports is slightly different because while sports um, ignites passions, it is not sports does not divide it unites um, and because sports unites we are able to enjoy sports irrespective of um, irrespective of who we support if we are uh, spectators we're able to enjoy the skill we're able to enjoy the um, the talent that sports people bring to the arena having said that a sports law essentially um, is premised on an acknowledgement that the shelf life of a sports person is very short. In other words, um, other than sports such as golf, which you, where you can extend your sporting life and career, uh, really, by the time a top sportsman hits 30, they are starting to go on the decline. And so, <clears throat> how do we ensure that sports people can maximize their talent? How do we ensure that when sports people have disputes relating to the utilization of their talent within the sports arena, that those disputes can be resolved in the shortest possible time? How do we ensure that those who are charged with resolving sports disputes are well versed with both the um, legality as well as the psychological makeup of the sports person. And I think we will all acknowledge that our sports, our, our court system, um, our normal court system is ill-equipped to deal with sports disputes because our normal sports, our normal court system um, you know, with, with the, the way in which we file pleadings, uh, the timetable, the uh, training of the judges is ill-equipped uh, to deal with sports men and women in a timely fashion, as well as the disputes that surround them. And so this was really the basis upon which Kenya saw it fit to establish a sports disputes tribunal. And I have the uh, privilege and honor of, of chairing the Sports Disputes Tribunal. I am now in my second term. And as you have pointed out, Philip, um, yes. in, the course, in the course of um, our tenure, we have had the opportunity to make many, many decisions uh, relating to sports disputes. Um, every kind of sport comes within the ambit of the Sports Tribunal. Um, our remit also includes dealing with doping violations. So we deal with Ian's customers, uh, those that they find in, uh, in breach of the doping regulations. Um, and so <clears throat> we have a specialization in both um, a strict sports law, dealing with sports people, just dealing with their disciplinary issues, dealing with their contractual issues, um, dealing with issues relating to the establishment and running of federations, elections, um, even dealing with issues around image rights and intellectual property that um, uh, sports people reserve to themselves. And I'm sure Dave is very well uh, qualified to speak on this and I will let him um, deal with that. Um, and to give them a one-stop shop 
where all these issues can be resolved as best as possible and as quickly as possible. Now, um, without delving into the um, into the jurisdiction of the sports tribunal for now, I just want to quickly say that as a result of the establishment of the sports disputes tribunal, there has been a great upsurge in the in in, in interest in sports law in Kenya. Um, because of the demand by sports people for the services of the tribunal, uh, sports people have sought out lawyers. Lawyers have had to acquaint themselves with sports law, uh, with the jurisprudence of the tribunal. Uh, but beyond that, we have also recognized that there are many, many sports people who do not have the resources uh, to be able to retain counsel. And so one of the things that we have done is to establish a pro bono list of lawyers um, to whom we can send sports people, especially those who are caught up in uh, doping violations, uh, to assist them. And we have had a very positive response from lawyers within the Kenya legal community who have come forward and who have indicated an interest in, uh, in appearing before the tribunal. And this has led to a, a significant interest in sports law. And so I hope that through this forum this afternoon, we can discuss in greater detail the tenets of sports law uh, and be able to learn from each other and to take questions as to um, the areas of sports law which may be of interest uh, to our listeners. So um, with that brief introduction, I'll just stop there and allow my other uh, panelists to, uh, to say something. Okay. All right, Dave, Dave, what is happening at Palmer Sport? What is Palmer Sport doing? How can the listeners tap into or develop a line of practice uh, after hearing from what you are doing as a practice? Please share with the audience. Right. <clears throat> First of all, am I audible? Yes. Excellent. Well, just to, just to start off, if I may, first, uh, a huge thank you to yourself, uh, Philip, to the East African Law Society for, for inviting me to speak on this panel and for inviting me again. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor when you're invited once. Um, it's now a duty bestowed upon me when I'm invited multiple times, and I'm happy to dispense with that duty. So thank you very much for for having me on board. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here with his honor, uh, Mr. Ohaga, and of course, Council uh, Ian Lutter. With regards to your question, Philip, what's going on at Palmer's? Um, the short answer is a lot. And we're very proud of that. We're very happy to, to be involved in, in many of these things. Uh, I think if we try and take it in a, in a linear manner, and I'll, I'll explain things in, in the most uh, succinct way possible in order to invite questions and discussion from both, of course, our, our panelists and all of our speakers later on. We are a boutique practice. We work solely in sports and our operation is international. Uh, as Philip, we've engaged many times before, you know, my personal interest lies in, in Africa and specifically East, East Africa uh, due yes. to my, my family, my parentage. But our client base, uh, thankfully, is completely spread from North America, Central South America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa, and, and, and so on. So we often engage in contentious matters at, uh, from a footballing perspective at FIFA and subsequently at CAS, uh, in addition to some ordinary procedures that we have at CAS as well. Um, from a non-footballing perspective, we're competent to handle issues at uh, various uh, international tribunals. Uh, I myself, I sit as the legal and governance director for the British Volleyball Federation, and we often do work in, in volleyball. Uh, I sit as an arbitrator for the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation, and I'm also involved with the International Boxing Association. So we have engagements in various different disciplines, and we operate at the 
the relevant tribunals for for several of these, as well as uh, for for esports, working with the Esports Integrity Coalition. Uh, in addition to that, and something you touched upon briefly, we also engaged in non contentious work. So we do have experience in contract negotiation, uh, both for conclusion or for termination. We have experience in the transfer of players, whether that's in football or in, in, other, in other disciplines. Um, and we have experience in, let's say, other commercial transactions, uh, whether it's to do with sponsorship, uh, whether it's to do with other engagements or activations, or to do with takeover of entities such as taking over of a football club. So we've got quite a wide range of, of experiences. And, and at the moment, to answer your question specifically, what's going on at Palmer's, uh, last week we filed, I think, four or five cases at uh, FIFA. Uh, we lodged one case at CAS. We've got another case at CAS that we're going to lodge this week and probably a second. So right now we've got a bit of a focus on contentious work. However, it depends on what's going on at the time. It depends on the market. There may be periods for two, three, four weeks where we're not having to do much litigation and we're just focusing on discussing matters with agents, preparing things for the upcoming transfer period and discussing where commercial terms need to be, need to be agreed. So it does vary. Um, during the transfer periods, it's a lot more negotiation based, but as it is right now, we're doing uh, quite a lot of litigation. Wow, nice to hear from you. Um, let me take it to, to Ian Luther before I come back to you, because commercialization is becoming an issue here. We just, in Uganda, we just had a, a new sports law that is awaiting presidential assent. And one of the key issues there is commercialization of sport but it's becoming a hot question and lawyers are asking themselves how to tap in and how to how to benefit from the sports industry big as it is so there is need like you said to bring on board more practical skills like contract negotiations and drafting i think it will be something that we shall discuss at a later stage with the is ELS Institute, because uh, the ELS Institute actually is also into training, capacity building. The Institute has an online learning portal where members can get different courses. I, I, I think I'll, I'll be in touch with the Secretariat to see that sports law is one of the courses that can be introduced, because at least on the panel, I am I'm very sure I know that you, Dev, and Luta are so engaged into sports law training yes yeah so luta please oh first of all i just want to thank you for including me in this webinar uh, as a young sports lawyer as we are referred to these days i am still new in the industry and considering that i'm surrounded by giants or other people who have been doing it for a while it's an honor for me to be here so for me as you've said i've specialized in sports law i have a master's in international sports law uh, from madrid spain and uh just coming back to kenya as a young hungry lawyer i was looking for where to hone my skills and uh, due to the amount of specialization that I had over the period of time that I spent there, I joined uh, the anti-doping agency of Kenya. And at ADAC, as you know, I feel like in East, Eastern Afri East Africa, uh, the anti-doping agency of Kenya has together, has the, one of the most comprehensive setups in the sense that we have an agency in place, we have a a national anti-doping code established by the Sports Act. And our mandate has basically to keep sports clean, as people say. And uh, for us, it's just to ensure, and to echo what my senior Mr. Haga said, sports, you can it's undeniable the effect that sports has in society. So having ADAC in place or anti-doping agencies in place and just the fight against doping 
is basically to ensure that sports, which is something that's ingrained in society from, it's one thing everyone in the world has in common. Every country partakes in a certain sport. So for having to protect athletes and keeping sports safe, is one of uh, is the mandate that we as ADAC do. And our role is just basically to test athletes and to ensure that our image as, Ke as Kenya as a country with regard to, because doping is, is really frowned upon in the world. And in the recent, the recent years, it's been a big, big problem in Kenya, as you might have seen. We have had to have interventions from World Athletics uh, intervention from MWADA uh, just recently while well, Secretary General was in Kenya. So it just shows you that doping is a, it's a big problem. And it's not just a problem that is in Kenya only, it's a problem around the world. And so ADAC is, and other anti-doping agencies, basically we're just here to ensure that the sport is clean, to ensure that uh, there's, and one thing I need to tell you is that uh, we work we collaborate with multiple agencies in the country. We work hand in hand with the sports dispute tribunal. So it's, doping is, it's a big thing. So, and I'm looking forward to the discussion so as to just demystify some of the things people know about doping. And because through, I facilitate sports law classes and a common theme is many people think doping only has to do with taking steroids, taking EPO and we have to change the narrative and just inform people that doping covers multiple things, multiple violations. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and yeah. Starting with you, Ian, uh, I think you need to bring it a little more open to the members. Yes. Because I happen, to, I happen to be at the Olympic qualifiers in Senegal, the last Olympic qualifiers. And doping included issues like, like when you miss, your test, yes. when you're called upon and you're not in position, yes. like, like they go to, like you're supposed to be at the dining hall at a given time yes. and you're not there, yes. uh, that doping agency would find you liable. Uh, how do lawyers tap into this area and where should their advice be? First of all, uh, Sports practice as, as an area of, of law, does it necessarily require a master's or because so many young lawyers out there think maybe someone needs to have a master's and get into this area? This is a question that will cut across the board. Um, I don't think so because uh, I think it's dependent on how deep one wants to delve into the sports world because at the end of the day sports law interacts with other facets of the law it's not just it's not sports independent of other facets of the law because you will interact with the national you interact with multiple branches of the law so i don't necessarily think that one has to undertake a masters however having a masters in sports law equips you with it's it's like being, like being a doctor. You're specialized in something. It means you have specialized training in a certain area of the law. So what I think is it's an added advantage to have at the start, but whoever, whoever doesn't have a master's in sports law can easily gain knowledge on sports law because of how wide sports law is, because there are different branches of sports law. And as you can see, there are people practicing doping, there are people practicing IP, there are people practicing employment uh, disputes. So there are very many facets, there, there are very many practice areas for sports law. All a master's does for you is equip you with specialized knowledge, which I feel like anyone can gain. How uh, it just might take a bit of more time, but I can't say you, for you to be good at it, you have to have a master's. All right. Uh, Senior Counsel John O'Haga, the last I heard from you uh, at Triple O, the firm was trying to put together 
uh, sports law practitioners across Africa? Yes, that's correct. How is this, how far have you gone first? And how is this helping the drive to, to develop sports more so in, in, in the area of uh, litigation? Um, Philip, let me approach your question slightly differently. Um, in order for lawyers to be able to properly exploit the area of sports law, we must first and foremost be able to commercialize sports. Yeah. Um, we must be able to commercialize sports. And in order to commercialize sports, we must be able to create an environment in which sports people are able to make a living out of sports across Africa. Now, when we look at sports globally, and a lot of times we focus on the, on the English Premier League, um, we focus on uh, La Liga, or we look at athletics and we look at the Diamond League and we see what those people earn. That is the exception. The unfortunate reality, uh, Philip, is that there are a lot of very, very talented sports persons in Africa who cannot make a living from their talent. And so the question that we need to address is how can our respective countries and jurisdictions uh, create an environment where sports people can focus on sports, can specialize, can live, eat, breathe sports from training at 6 a.m. through to when they go to bed at 8 p.m. In my experience, we have dealt with the contractual matters relating to sports, uh, persons who are employed by um, whether it is um, um, a football club or a volleyball club. And it saddens me when I look at what the actual remuneration is. It is a pittance. Yeah. It's putting it lightly. Now, if the sports person cannot properly exploit his or her talent, then there isn't really very much for lawyers to be able to uh, delve into sports law as a specialization, as a specialization. So I'm very pleased to hear that Uganda has a bill pending in parliament um, in which one of the areas of focus is the commercialization of sports. I follow very keenly, as you'd imagine, development uh, around sports in Kenya. And I can tell you that um, in Kenya, uh, we have now revived the, the issue or the proposal to have a sports lottery. Sports lottery was on the cards about eight or 10 years ago as one of the proposals that would be used to fund sports. Unfortunately, it was hijacked by um, entrepreneurs um, and we all know how much betting companies have been able to rip uh, from establishing sports lotteries. So it just tells you what the potential is within our sports environment. One of the reasons why we established a pro bono list for an invited council uh, to make themselves available is because when I look at the athletes that come before the tribunal facing um, charges related to doping violations, it is clear to me that they cannot even afford the benefit of legal counsel. And this begs the question, why they go into doping, for instance? It begs the question as to what education they have received about doping. It begs the question, what education sports people generally 
within a country like Kenya, which is so rich in sports, receive about doping, about um, the exploitation of their talent, about image rights, about what is available to them um, with respect to sponsorship, with respect to being brand ambassadors, and so on, with respect to contractual negotiations, when they go into contracts with their various clubs, with respect to transfers and fees um, and agents and agreements that they enter into with agents and so on. So that is a big obstacle we have found in our attempt to um, ignite an interest in sports law across Africa. The fact that we have to ask ourselves a question, can you as a sports lawyer survive on your training in sports law alone within any of our jurisdictions in, in Africa. I would be very interested in Ian's response. I'm sure Dave has a very different perspective because uh, he comes from a different environment. He's better able to exploit his training and his, um, his abilities. But the reality for us is very different, uh, different. And that's something I think we need to discuss as a fraternity. All right, that, that is so insightful. Like you said, uh, we, have been, we have been delighted that our law touches on the issue of commercialization, which is critical to, to how people will earn. And I think that's another way lawyers will also tap into or have interest into sports litigation mainly, because most times you find lawyers who are into sports will do the administrative work more than the legal work that is supposed to be done. So the aspect of commercialization is key, like you have said, and also the arrangement to have lawyers who are interested coming into practice on call for pro bono work for our friends who are into sports, but they are not, they do not have the resources. But on the same note, I think, like you said, uh, Dave has a different perspective that he can give, mainly on the issue of commercialization. Where, which avenues should we tap into to see that uh, we tighten the grip and enlarge the space for practice and with the intended benefit? Oh, thanks, Philip. Um, and if I may, just like, um, just like uh, uh, his honor, Mr. Ohaga had started off responding to you. Let me, let me approach your question in a slightly different manner. First, if I can, I'll just piggyback onto some of the discussions with regards to the sports bill in Uganda. Now, having said that, I've, uh, I, my, my knowledge with regards to the sports bill is, is limited to what I've seen in the media and some discussions I've had with some of our esteemed colleagues on ground in Uganda, many, many of whom that you, Philip, will be aware of yourself. But when we're talking about commercialization, it's one thing seeking to enshrine the principle or even the definition of commercialization into legislation. It's another thing understanding from a practical perspective how we're going to be able to enable commercialization. OK, so if we're talking about ensuring that we have a commercial element in Section 2.2, that's fantastic. But how do we enable all of the stakeholders to be able to access these funds so that they can, as uh, as Mr. Ohaga was saying earlier, pay athletes more than a pittance? Yeah. To, to, to use that that terminology just for the, 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 the purpose of this argument. So I think we've always got to be very mindful of discussing commercialization, but then truly creating an environment, as has already been touched on previously, that can be commercialized and can be commercialized in a sustainable manner. It doesn't seek after six months or one year for a sugar daddy or a sugar mummy to come along and put in more investment. And then we're in a situation where if someone doesn't come along and put in uh, all of the shillings that we require, we're, we're out with our begging bowl. And, and with respect, and I say this in a, in a direct manner, but a respectful manner, bearing in mind that we also 
have uh, situations where we've represented betting companies, we then find ourselves in a situation where we're, we're at the behest of essentially the, the betting companies to be able to rule the, the sport, which has positives, but it can also lead us into to treacherous territory. So I think from a Uganda perspective, I'm hoping that what I've seen and what I've heard from the, the sports bill not only talks about commercialization, but enables the commercialization in the background for the football clubs, for the NGBs and for all of the other bodies involved at both professional and at grassroots level to be able to generate that income so that it flows and it cascades right down the pyramid. Now, if we then take that principle and look at it from an international perspective, going on to your question about what do we need to look at, let's say, to increase and harness commercialization? Well, let's look at what many people might refer to are the obvious things. Where are the other competitions making money, right? Where is the EPL, for instance, making money? The EPL is making money from broadcasting, right? La Liga is making money from broadcasting and so on and so forth. The biggest commercially viable entities in the world of sports primarily make their money from broadcasting. So the easy answer might be one plus one equals two. Let's get broadcasting over into Uganda. Let's get broadcasting over into Kenya. Let's get broadcasting over into Rwanda. And that's not wrong. But again, I go back to the point that was already made by Mr. Ohaga. We need to create the environment for commercialization to be active, for it to thrive. We need to create the environment for people to want to place their eyeballs on our product, for a valuation to be derived therefrom, right? It's not as easy as saying, let's make sure that we get some cameras on ground, on the touchline, Let's make sure that uh, Bandari versus Kenya police is, is filmed and it's aired on, on Nation and all of a sudden we're going to get money out of it. It doesn't work that way. We need to create the value and this takes time. So, yes, we look at broadcasting, but how do we actually harness the, the strength of broadcasting sports in our own country? Is it something or in our, in our own country and in the continent? Is it something that we have to do in a slightly different manner? Do we focus on the untapped talents, the grassroots talents, the emerging uh, boys and girls who are uh, long jumpers, football players, volleyball players, whatever else it might be, and try and generate value and eyeballs on, on, on that as a product? Or do we say, right, uh, we've got uh, the 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 Premier League in Tanzania. Simba are playing Yanga this week, and we're going to try and compete with Man United, Liverpool, and we try to see if we can get uh, attention uh, taken away from the hundreds of millions of other people that want to watch the EPL instead. So the the broadcasting element is is one thing, right? And that comes as a consequence of creating value in your own your own product and creating the right environment. The same principle applies for sponsorship. Sponsorship is always a consequence. If people see that there are eyeballs on your product, they're willing to attach their brand, their company to your product accordingly. But creating that value is the key thing. Do we go and swim in the same pool as Man United and Arsenal and Real Madrid and Barcelona when everyone's playing on a Saturday afternoon and all of a sudden Nairobi City Stars has got to compete with that? Or... Do we try and focus on something completely different? And we've seen in certain markets, particularly in the Middle East, for instance, where there now tends to be a focus on trying to air disciplines like esports. Now, this is a completely different topic, Philip, and we would need another three, four hours just to tap into the, the introduction of, of esports, no doubt. Same with with Ian's subject, which is so specific. When we start talking about doping, we need another, another week. But it, just to mention it very briefly, we have certain markets now where they're saying, okay, we understand that Al-Hilal and Al-Nasr is a big draw for us in the MENA region, but it's not going to compete with the El Clasico. So we'll do what we're doing. We'll do a, the best job we possibly can, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. However, we can focus on 
our Overwatch League. We can focus on what's happening with our local League of Legends League. We can focus on the esports content in a different way that may not be appearing on a Saturday afternoon in, in our time zone. So there's content there that can be consumed and eyeballs can naturally travelate towards it. So thinking of different ways in which we can create value on the disciplines that that we we are practicing. And I think that is the foundation for creating an environment where commercialization can thrive. It's all well and good talking about commercialization in a in a in a document uh, or in a in a thesis or, or something along those lines, but the principles of governance apply here, structures and cultures. We can draft the structure in five minutes. It takes a generation to change the culture. And the same principle applies in the sense that we can talk about commercialization until the cows come home, but we need to create an environment for that commercialization to thrive. And that takes time. That's not a product that's going to happen overnight. We don't flick a switch. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, my A little there's a question question is uh which question is uh what are the panelists thoughts on electronic i think that has been answered by uh, by dev this question is particularly on uh what type of legal structures have the panelists encountered in protecting the rights and remuneration of minors in sports i would like uh Ian to come in on this because uh, even today FUFA, our local fo football federation, just launched a campaign against uh, against uh, betting, match fixing actually, uh, and I think it is usually here that uh, legal structures come in for the rights mostly of minors being an anti-doping aspect or an an issue that minors face a lot can we have okay so please go on okay sorry um so with regards to doping uh where minors are involved the wada code is not as uh let's say thorough with minors as it is to persons who are who are do person uh it's not the harshness of sanctions is not the same with regard to to older athletes athletes above the age of 18 because age is a mitigating factor when sanctioning an athlete who's a minor so how WADA and uh, anti-doping agencies look at minors, they look at minors as uh, persons who are going to be handed the mantle to compete and continue with their career. So it's assumed that at the minor stage, you are not yet well exposed to the fight against doping and you, you've not garnered enough experience to actually understand what doping entails. So we are, we are quite, lenient on uh, minors with regards to doping so it's not they are not it's not frowned upon and also it's important to note that how seriously minors are looked at is stems from the fact that it's assumed that if you poison the mind of a minor you continue it's like you put a stain on the sport a stain on the generation that comes along because doping is like anything else is something learned it's something you practice so instilling such ideas into a minor such a practice into a minor is highly frowned upon and the laws against uh athlete support personnel who aid minors in doping are very strict it can go as far as life bans so with minors doping is anti-doping organizations are very lenient when dealing with minors so they're not looked at with the same uh, velocity as older athletes are looked at the measuring the measuring stick is very different for minors and yes senior counsel john ohaga being a judge also there's a question that concerns you you said uh, 
in legal, at legal representation, be, legal representation is a problem to sportsmen because they cannot afford advocates. Why can't we allow contingent fees even for sports alone? Shouldn't we give competent advocates an incentive to represent players with the pay coming after you win? If you lose, it's pro bono. If you win, you get something in return. More advocates, more advocates would take up sports cases. Senior counsel, what is your view? And uh, maybe if you are attempting that, the other question would be, please share what the impact of your decisions at the tribunal has been to the sports sector. Um, Philip, before I go on to that, can I just chime in on what uh, Ian had to say about minors? Please do, please do. Um, I think we need to understand that there are many multiple actors in the doping environment. And so, for instance, the Anti-Doping Act gives the sports tribunal jurisdiction not only in relation to the athlete, but also what Ian referred to, what are called athlete support personnel. That will include coaches, managers, physiotherapists, nutritionists, everybody who supports an athlete. Then it also gives us jurisdiction over pharmacists and medical practitioners as well, because those are people involved in prescribing um, um, substances that are pre prescribed by the water code. So when we talk about minors, and I will tell you about one case that we had to deal with in relation to swimming, where there was a minor athlete, I think it was a lady, she was 15 or 16, and the evidence eventually that emerged was to the effect that um, the doping was facilitated for the minor, both by the minor's parents, um, especially the mother, and the minors coaches and managers you have to appreciate that minors because of their status do not get into doping just you know as accidentally there is an infrastructure around them which supports their growth and supports their participation uh, parents have ambitions for their children when their children go into sport they have ambitions for their children and sometimes that ambition uh, can be driven in a direction which is injurious to the minor and which offends uh, doping policy and doping legislation. And so you have to deal with that as well. So when we talk about minors, we have to look at, look at who is responsible for the minor. And we know in law that essentially guardians are responsible for the minor. And it depends now how you um, you, you, you categorize the guardian, whether it is a parent or whether it is a guardian who has been given responsibility over the minor uh, in law. Uh, and so the uh, whole doping legislation and infrastructure will also seek to discover who is facilitating this for the minor. Um, Water code and doping policy and legislation also um, encourages whistleblowing. So there are breaks that we give to uh, pharmacists, uh, support personnel who whistleblow uh, in the sense that their sanction may be reduced or um, they may get off with a lighter sanction. So the entire code is geared towards not just, um, not just uh, dis discouraging doping, but also supporting the fight against doping, whether by athletes who are of uh, majority age or athletes who are minors and who therefore require support. Now, the question of contingent fees is a very interesting one. I myself are in full support of contingency fees. The problem is I think legislation 
has not kept up with developments in the legal arena. Um, you will remember that last year, towards the end of last year, we had a full session in which I talked about third party funding in arbitration. Yeah. And this is on the same footing. I think that access to justice demands that we must establish creative ways of ensuring that litigants, uh, users, uh, people approaching the legal system are facilitated in being able to access, uh, whether it is legal services, being able to access courts and courtrooms and tribunals. And in order to do that, we must, must find a way in which contingent uh, fees uh, becomes part of the reality in this jurisdiction. I think it is now uh, something that uh, should be consigned to the vestiges of legal history. Um, and I think it is time to reform our respective uh, advocates acts and uh, other legislation. Uh, but I think that that would be a creative way in which um, advocates may support uh, athletes who want to access, uh, who want to access either um, tribunals such as ours, but in many other ways, you will realize that contingency fees, I'm sure, are already uh, being used. Um, they may not come out to the surface, but I'm sure that when a lawyer, for instance, drafts a contract for an athlete in relation to um, a brand ambassadorship or in relation to a sponsorship with a, a sponsor, a corporate sponsorship, um, they draft it on the basis that it is only when the athlete is paid that the athlete will will pay uh, for that. So the reality of commerce today uh, really means that there are people already practicing contingency fees. Uh, and I think that we do need to lobby our legislations in order to allow that to become a, a part of the facets of uh, the provision of legal services. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senior Counsel. And Dev, to you, I think there are listeners who, who feel that Casimiro should be transferred straight away. One is saying, provide a little light about the law governing transfer window. The other one is saying, could you please take us through the process of player transfers? And maybe also highlight on the, on the intermediary, the new rules for, the, for intermediaries. Uh, I think there were the, the December rules so that people get to know where they can also tap into that space because some, some, some of our listeners could choose to be intermediaries, but they also need to know what it takes. Thank you. As I come back to you, senior counsel. Thanks, Philip. Um, right, so there's essentially three questions there and <clears throat> mindful of time, I'll try and uh, uh, truncate the responses as much as possible. And then of course, if anyone's got any more detailed questions thereafter, then uh, as, as you know, Philip, I'm always happy to have discussions after the, the webinar and my, my contact details can be furnished accordingly. First one, should Casemiro be transferred? No, that's clearly coming from anyone that's not a Manchester United fan. Uh, but with regards to the, the point of how transfer windows, as we are colloquially referring to them as they're the the transfer registration periods officially um under fifa how they're governed they're governed by the fifa regulation so essentially what we have in every single jurisdiction uh that fifa has uh hold over from a regulatory perspective there are 211 member associations at the moment that are signed up to fifa just to give you an idea of how important football is huh? uh mr ohaga was talking about it earlier politics religion and sports now, if we think about the number of nations that we have signed up to the UN, we have 192 signatories, but we've got 211 FIFA member associations. So that tells you straight away the reach of, of, of football, and that's just football. We can then talk about the other, other disciplines and the reach that they have, but we've got 211 member associations, and FIFA basically outlines that each one of these associations, wherever they have a professional league taking place they will have two transfer registration periods one will be a longer period and one will be a shorter period the longer period is usually for a period of 12 weeks and the shorter period is usually for a period of four weeks now in the european calendar let's say 
uh, which is July to June. Uh, we referred to the longer period as the summer transfer window and the shorter period would be the, the January transfer window. However, this might vary depending on whether you're based in Central Asia, whether you're based in South America and so on and so forth. So the, the rules with regards to how transfer periods are dictated are governed at FIFA regulatory level and all of the member associations have to abide by those rules accordingly. Now, your second question was with, with regards to how a transfer takes place. I think that's what you said, Philip? Yes, yes. Yeah? Okay. So again, I'll try and put it into a very short and simple manner. Now, the FIFA rules outline that a club um, cannot contact a player that is employed by another club. Yeah, there's only two instances in which a club can directly contact another player. The first instance is where the, the holding club or the employer club has granted express permission for the purchasing club to do so. And the second instance is where the player's contract is within the final six months uh, prior to expiry and where there is an international dimension. So let's say, for example, the, the player was playing in England and a Scottish club wants to, to discuss terms with this player. They can directly speak to this player within the final six months of this contract. Now, some jurisdictions have adopted this rule directly within to their own regulations. So it may be that within England, for instance, or within Italy, for instance, you can have that six months, that final six months rule at national level but is it, it is not something that you find in every single country so as a definite rule if there's an international dimension and you're within the last six months of your contract the club can speak directly and then you've also got to see what the rules in in your country might or might not say so aside from that what a club would essentially have to do to sign a player they would have to establish whether the player wants to come along to that club and whether they've got the affordability to sign that player, A, by way of dispensing with any transfer fees, and B, by being able to deal with any salary requests that the player might have. In order to do that, without being able to contact the, uh, the player directly, what they would do is they would use an agent. Okay, So this is where agents start to come in, into the game in, in the first place. They are there to be able to provide information to the purchasing club and explain to them what the position is without compromising the position of the player at his or her holding club. Because you can imagine from a pure business perspective, if the purchasing club goes to the selling club and says, I want your product, the selling club's going to say, okay, no problem. Five million, is that what the newspapers are saying? We want 10. And straight away, your negotiating position changes. Your bargaining power is weakened because the selling party knows that you want their product. This is simple. This is not to do with law. This is not to do with football. This is just pure negotiation and negotiation tactics, right? So the agent comes in in a very convenient manner to be able to explain what the selling club might require, uh, whether there is going to be a fee, what that fee might look like, uh, as well as the salary, so that the buying club can then get into a position where they can determine the affordability, assess whether that particular product, for putting it in a, in, in, in a very crass term, would equate to product from another club and whether the cost-benefit valuation would, would match. And if they do want to go for that player, they can then make a formal offer accordingly for the club to provide permission for things to move forward. So what tends to happen is we have this entire iceberg of work that takes place before you get to the stage of a club offering, uh, the club affording permission and a player actually signing. And what we also see with the drama of deadline day that we see on Sky Sports or on BN TV or whatever else we might be watching, we often see that transfers feel like they take place in an instant, where the brutal reality, certainly at the top end, is that transfers are planned almost a year in advance. And all of this is going on 
all of the, the the politics and the position plays are coming in to get to a, a stage where the agent can concretely say to the purchasing party, look, this is the transfer fee, this is the salary, verbally let's agree on everything, now you just send the formal paper, and once the formal paper uh, making an offer of transfer is done, all of a sudden within 24 hours the player is is signed but there's a hell of a lot that actually goes on in the background now that's just giving you uh, an overview within five minutes there's a lot more that we can discuss for example we're engaged in a transfer right now that's been going on for six months already with a view to having it being concluded in the summer and the amount of things that we can talk about just this one particular transfer would again take a lot more than this entire session however i hope that that's very briefly uh, sort of encapsulated it. And then the final one was the agents. Now you use the word inter intermediary and you use it correctly, but correctly for the moment, because the current regulations that are still in play are the regulations on working with intermediaries, which came into force on the 1st of April, 2015. However, the new rules have now been published. They were published on the 9th of January, uh, at the start of this year. Uh, and they're now the FIFA football agents regulations. So the term intermediary uh, which was in play for eight years is now going to be effectively redundant again and we're going back to the term agent uh, because for the last eight years under FIFA regulations the term agent didn't exist uh, and these rules will fully come into force on the 1st of October of this year we have partial enforcement of some of the rules right now but the full enforcement will be 1st of October this year if someone is keen on becoming an agent, the licensing will now be centralized again. So you'll be given, uh, upon passing an exam, you'll be given a FIFA license as opposed to having to register as an intermediary under FUFA or an intermediary under FKF or whatever else it might have been previously. You will become a FIFA licensed agent. And there are two exams that are scheduled. The first one is in April. I think it's April the 18th or 19th. And the registration period is currently open. And then the second one, I believe, is sometime around September, for which the registration period will open in the summer. And once you pass those one of those exams, you'll have a, a license. Once you have the license um, within your arsenal, so to speak, you have an obligation to engage in CPD courses every single year to ensure that you're fully able and upskilled to continue your practice on an ongoing basis. So three questions you asked me, Philip, or were, were put to you from the audience. I hope I've answered all of them in a very brief manner. Thank you, because this is a critical area that so many people want to tap into, because they think or they feel there is a lot of money into that business uh ian has been so quiet but i'll address this question to him many athletes and sports organizations in kenya are not aware of their legal rights and obligations as stakeholders in the sports law industry what are you doing to remedy this um, um from the perspective from the perspective of Adak, Adak. and i think mr Hagar can Mr. agree yeah. with me on this we have a situation where Athletes tend to say that they're not aware that an anti-doping rule were initial that they committed was doping. A lack of education has somehow come to be a very common defense for many athletes. And uh, us as ADAC, we've had to deal with a lot of uh, situations where athletes say they're not educated enough on what entails doping. Because as I mentioned earlier, doping isn't just the use of a prohibited substance. There are very many components to doping and they're covered in the anti-doping code from article 2.1 to 2.11. So as you can see, doping is a very, it's a wide, it's something very wide and it encompasses very many different anti-doping rule violations. So as an agency, we try to educate athletes as often as possible. We conduct a lot of capacity building sessions with athletes and we have an education department which transverses the country uh, to different parts of the country, trying to educate athletes about their rights, trying to educate them about um, uh, 
just what entails doping, how to go about uh, seeking uh, like a therapeutic use exemption if you need one. So as an agency, I can say that resources have been put to ensure that athletes are educated about their rights. And uh, I think that the education aspect and the aspect about capacity building when it comes to athletes is not just it can be done independently by the agency because a lot of things change every day the law is changing every day uh things are changing in that anti-doping um world fraternity per se so we try our best to ensure that athletes are educated about everything that they need to know but of course it's it's not i, I can't say it's easy because uh our education team has to cover different parts of the country, but we do and we hold capacity, we hold webinars like this to ensure that athletes are up to speed. So from an agency perspective, I can do that. We, I can give us an eight out of 10 with regards as to how we're educating our athletes. I can't hear you. That is wonderful, and I think Senior Council would also add that uh, many of the players, stakeholders have gone to the sports tribunal. Uh, I read there was a recent case of a, of a head coach who had been fired, who knew of his being fired in the newspapers. So I think it's about, uh, it's about sensitization and people getting to know, like, like this, this arm of sports law, there's already a comment here from uh, from uh, I say comment from Sharon Moturi, who says as in-house lawyer, she is saddened by how much as advocates do not understand sports and sports law. She talks of the Sports Act itself is written in is a well-written legislation, but doesn't deal with sportsmen and women federations, etc. There's room for change in the law, and we shouldn't shy away from the same. Also, sports is not about doping, but much more. I'll go direct to Senior Counsel Ohaga. He is on record to have at one point said uh, the sports law in Kenya is not a good piece of legislation. What should a good piece of legislation entail, and uh, how should it how should it address issues that affect all players because i think it's a question of uh when people know about sports and what they should be doing and how they should approach it senior counsel um yes um yes you're correct uh, philip i've been on record uh, not not once uh, but several times in uh, putting forward my views uh, and uh, and i would repeat them here I do not think the Sports Act is, um, is a properly thought out piece of legislation. I think that there is much more that could be addressed in the Sports Act. Indeed, um, every time we have to deal with a challenging case before the tribunal, uh, it just reminds us how much more uh, the Sports Act could have, could have, um, could have um, spelt out. Uh, the Sports Act, I think, um, maybe was, was um, I don't know whether it was a compromise legislation, or whether it was legislation which was uh, put in place hurriedly. Um, but what we have, we have now is we have a Sports Act, and then we have a separate anti-doping act. Um, and the tribunal has to balance between the two. Uh, for one, the tribunal's jurisdiction under the Sports Act is, on the face of it, very narrow. It does not allow sports people to exhaust to the fullest extent possible their rights and remedies before the tribunal. And what we have had is therefore um, a lot of preliminary objections, a lot of challenges to jurisdiction, um, we have also had sports people having to come to the tribunal uh, to give them um, an opinion that would enable them to determine how to exercise their rights, because those rights are not properly captured within the Sports Act. 
Um, and in the, it's a, it's a 2013, is it, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, that just tells you that if in that period we have not been able to make traction towards commercialization, that therefore it is not achieving that primary of, um, of objection. In fact, the Sports Act makes reference to uh, professional athletes and so on and so forth. But when we look at uh, the environment within Kenya, uh, how many true professional athletes are we able to identify who can truly say they are professional and they are able uh, to earn a proper living uh, not hand-to-mouth existence, but a proper living from being in sports. I think that legislation should be facilitative. It should, pre 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 it should give us the tools uh, from which we are able to then exploit our talents as athletes. Uh, and in that respect, I do not think that it has achieved um, the objective that it was set out to do. Um, when we look at, for instance, the proliferation of sports betting, the Sports Act does not cover sports betting at all. Uh, you have to look for side legislation to see, in, in my view, um, there could have been a lot of uh, revenue that could have been generated from sports betting, for instance, by levying um, some sort of uh, percentages from the takings that sports bet, sports betting companies are able to achieve. That's just one. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have to look at different different rules and regulations between different international organizations to determine how each sport should govern itself. And whilst that gives flexibility, it does not give us a homegrown foundation from which to spring forward. Uh, and so we are left in limbo um, and left to look at other tools from which we can then uh, be able to facilitate our sports people. So I think that uh, more work needs to be done. I know that there have been uh, numerous uh, representations to parliament with respect to amendments to the Sports Act, uh, but I think that it needs a complete overhaul. It needs a complete overhaul. I'd be very interested to look at your the Uganda physical and sports, um, is it physical and sports persons bill or what? Hopefully, it is a better thought out piece of legislation, uh, and I will look at it to just see what uh, it provides. So that that's my view. Thank you, Cynthia. I think it's not. I, I would pass. I, I personally had the opinion that the 1964 Act was a better legislation than the bills that were tabled in Parliament, only that it lacked implementation. Just like you, I've been on record to say that we could have stayed with the 1964 Act. It's already gaining controversy on a few issues here and there. Things like, uh, like, uh, like, like influ, like interference because uh, it seeks somehow to bring the national, to give National Council of Sports so many powers. So where you find that there's controversy between a local federation and the National Council of Sports, then government has to come in. Then the International Federation will also need to come in. It has happened to Kenya before when FIFA had to intervene and uh, it didn't go well with the federation there. Uh, before we get into our next few questions, there are some questions in the Q&A that uh, I think Harry Almonisi is asking for which institution has sports law. Uh, UCU, Uganda Christian University, has started that course. Uh, you can also reach out to Sports Legal. Unfortunately, my co co-moderator is not on call, but uh, she she does, she teaches. I've, I've personally done sports mediation training from there uh, at Sports Legal Kenya. Then, then we have uh, the other question in relation to that is, uh, uh, 
rates. In relation to that, another question was, All right, I think that is it. But um, to Dev, to you, Dev, Gilbert from uh, Rwanda has a question. He says you motivated him to do sports law. So he says, how far can we create sport? How far is it effective to create Sports, a sports lawyers regional network, and uh, secondly, how far is it effective to challenge the issue of legal systems? I think it comes from the point of common law and civil law among lawyer practices, because the the Rwanda has a different system from the other East African countries. And I think the first question was so critical because uh, some time back, Dave wanted to come up with the Sports Lawyers Association. He's asking how, how can we come up with a strong regional association for sports law practitioners? I think that will go across to you. Senior counsel has already tried. We need to know how far he has gone with that. No, look. Thanks, um, <clears throat> thanks, Philip, and thank you, uh, thank you, Gilbert. It's uh, it's very good to see you on the call, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, good to see many others that that have engaged with the call as well. Uh, Mrs. Rawal, uh, Peter Meshkilwa, Kabano Trust. It's great to have wonderful representation from all of East Africa. And look, latching onto that, I think it's very important to have these kinds of these kinds of groups, these kinds of bodies, these kinds of associations. And, and, and of course, we've already had the, the point made by Mr. Ohaga that uh, they've been working on, on the same or something similar in any case. It's important for this to be there, A, for the, the collection of like-minded in individuals to come together and to share knowledge to share information, to share best practice, or at least best practice views, and B, for this collection of individuals to continue to grow, to be used as, uh, if nothing else, a lobby for the, the, the parties in power, for the government of the day, for the regulatory bodies, to fully understand that there's a bunch of people on the ground who are operating in this area that are practicing on a day-to-day -day basis and they are able to 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 see to assess and to analyze some of the issues that that arise accordingly without having this stakeholder engagement it's very difficult for the governing bodies whether it's at state level or whether it's at international level to be able to accurately and appropriately dispense with their duty of, of updating or amending the, the rules, the, the regulations, the bylaws or the legislation accordingly. And a lot of these things come from having bodies on the ground that, that pull together, uh, gather a stakeholder opinion, and they funnel this opinion forward to the government of the day, to FIFA to the relevant NGP, whoever it is that we're talking about. Uh, so it's foundational, it's critical, and it's something that I'm a massive proponent of. Of course, we've then got to look at the efficacy of these kinds of bodies. Uh, I certainly don't believe in creating bodies for the sake of having bodies. Uh, I certainly don't believe in having bodies that become isolated, self-fulfilling prophecies. No, they've got to have a clear vision, a clear mission, and they've got to be able to gather the relevant intel and information to be able to feed it on to the people that they're, or to the bodies that they're collaborating with. So yeah, Gilbert, for me, you definitely got to have something like, like that. And there are a few people out there that are trying it. Uh, I certainly encourage yourself and others who are interested to either get involved with these bodies uh, 
or set up your own body. But at the same time, if you do do that, don't forget that this is a moment for collaboration, not for unnecessary competition. We've still got to come together and we've got to work in tandem to be able to, to, to develop the, the ecosystem. Uh, so that's that's the, the first part. What was the second part, Philip? I think that, that you you just you just handled it well. Um, okay. Maybe the other, the other issue is uh, I think there seems to be need. To do masters in sports, so they're not even or lack the knowledge. Yes, Dave, can you hear me? Sorry, Philip, I, I, I didn't hear the, the question at all. I don't know if the others did. Forgive me, if you could kindly repeat. It's a question on, uh, on the availability of opportunities to do the masters in sports law or more training. Okay. I think, yeah. Okay. Well, again, for those of you that have uh, had to bear the burden of listening to me before, I'm, I'm sure you'll be aware that uh, in addition to my private practice, uh, I sit as a director at the Instituto Superior de Derecho y Economía, um, which is ISDE, uh, based in Spain. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm very confident that anyone that's keen on developing in sports law will know all about ISDE. Uh, I would preface this, however, by latching onto the point that um, Ian had mentioned earlier. Your personal circumstances will always dictate how necessary it is for you to go and have a master's. Uh, I'm not here to, to sell a master's degree to you or to sell is there to you. Uh, with respect, the institution sells itself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm there to deal with, with the syllabus. But your own circumstances will dictate whether you you need to go down that route or whether you're in a position where you can still access these opportunities without necessarily having done a master's having a master's will be of advantage necessarily but it's not um it's not something that is is mandatory with regards to access to to opportunities i'm working on the presumption and philip you'll correct me if i'm if i'm going in a different direction when we talk yeah. about access to opportunities uh, a lot of it um, is inherently focusing on on access to to, to funding to, to scholarships and, and things like that now i'm very uh, i'm very aware of what these day does and doesn't have and they do have some scholarship programs in place so it does enable access to people that might not necessarily have the funding to be able to pay for these kinds of courses, or they might not be able to get the familial support or be able to get a loan from the bank or whatever else it might be. They can mitigate this burden to a certain extent. And I'm very confident that other institutions will do similar things as well. But with regards to specificity um, uh, in relation to what other institutions might or might not provide, unfortunately, I'm, I'm unable to tell because I don't know what the, you know, what the internal processes or the applications uh, open are but in general speaking as speaking as a professor and speaking as someone that uh, encourages people to to upskill themselves and to engage in this sector yes there are opportunities out there uh, yes there are packages to support with funding out there and one mustn't ever be discouraged from pursuing this pathway due to a fear that they might not be able to afford it. It may be the case that you're unable to afford something immediately. That may very well be true. However, there are mechanisms out there, either within certain institutions, uh, such as these there, or sometimes within um, governing bodies, uh, legislative bodies, um, uh, local councils within the country, that have money pots allocated for foreign students coming in that want to specifically study a certain type of course within their country. Even the European Union, if you know where to access it, provides grants for students coming into the EU and, and studying certain things. So 
the key is just understanding that there are pots of money available. And as long as you can find them and you're able to fulfill the relevant criteria, you'll definitely be in a position where you can mitigate the financial burdens, which uh, can can look quite bad when you look at a sports law course at many of these institutions where they charge 30,000 euros. Uh, it is expensive, but don't don't let that deter you in a in a, in in a conclusive manner. Thank you, Dave. But I think uh, also the ELS East African Law Society should take note that uh, just the three panelists here have enough knowledge to to constitute a program that can give intro introductory courses to to the members. So we shall have a further engagement on that. It can be an online program. I believe senior counsel will be willing to to give a few lectures and uh, Ian. Uh, there's a burning question to Ian and senior counsel. Surprisingly, it's from uh, Triple OK Law. Uh, the question to Ian is whether ADAC would be amenable to ADR being applied in ADAC cases in Kenya. And uh, similarly to senior counsel, whether the sports dispute tribunal would consider ADR and mediation in anti-doping matters. Um, and to answer that question, unfortunately, I don't think ADAC would be able to engage in ADR themselves because considering we have uh, WADA as the custodian of the World Anti-Doping Code, the Anti-Doping Code is our Bible per se in the doping fraternity. The code dictates how cases should be handled. It dictates how sanctions should be imposed. So ADAC being a national anti-doping organization cannot now step in and try to fill in and try to play the role of, let's say try to use mediation or um, uh, use other forms of dispute, alternative dispute resolution to resolve cases because WADA is a custodian, as I've said. They, and Mr. Ohaga can support me on this when I say they have people, it's like they have people watching. They know how cases go because as an agency, whenever an athlete has been charged with a doping case, we report to WADA, WADA are aware. So we then can, can turn around and say, on the case of uh, uh, Dev, we decided we are going to institute mediation and we are going to let the, par the party go scot free. That's not how it works. So, for as long as WADA is a custodian of, uh, like, because in the, uh, the, the anti doping ecosystem has the national anti doping organizations under WADA, we form part of the anti doping, uh, the doping ecosystem, meaning WADA is at the top and we are its subsidiaries. So they are the ones who set the laws and we follow the laws as they, as they have been set. So we can't now turn to using alternative disputes of, alternative mechanisms of dispute resolution. So it's not on ADAC to do. That is a bone to pick with WADA. Thank, thank you, Ian. Uh, and I think before senior counsel comes in, there's another question which is directed to you from Moses Mwase. Moses Mwase also happens to be my sports administrative course lecturer at UOC. Mm -hmm. uh, he says it's a pleasure to listen in to Mr. Ohaga and ISDE Professor Dev alongside Ian. To Mr. Ohaga, the Kenyan Sports Act does not make any specific reference to the CAS, no recognized CAS which is a requirement by IOC and other IFs. How has Kenya handled this challenge, especially where stakeholders can choose to originate filings at CAS directly or on appeal? Is ADAC accommodative of CAS? Um, yes, ADAC is very, very accommodative of CAS because CAS has, with regards to disputes, CAS said uh, that most of our jurisprudence has been set by CAS. So technically, while in the process, like while we draft uh, submissions that we present before the sports district tribunal, 
most of our most of the cases you find us citing are cases from CAS because um, doping uh, CAS has been in existence longer than than uh, than ADAC. It has been in existence longer than the Sports Dispute Tribunal, and uh, the rules of procedure and uh, some of the way we, some of uh, the the way we do things is we are mainly trying to emulate CAS. And um, if I delve into if I delve deeper into talking about my opinion on how the Sports Dispute Tribunal is set up with, with uh, in relation to CAS, I would talk for I'd go on and on because I feel like so much needs to be amended so that our Sports Dispute Tribunal can also function as an independent body from the judiciary to work exactly like CAS. But that's a story for another day. But uh, with regards to ADAC, we do uh, recognize the presence of CAS. We work hand very. We have a very close relationship with CAS, and uh, the head of our legal team is us. And uh, Mr. Haga can support this. There are cases that CAS. Uh, there are cases that CAS. Uh, that uh, the on first instance cases go to the sports dispute tribunal, and on second instance, then appeals go to CAS. So whenever an appeal has been lodged to CAS, ADAC is, is attached, is part of the appeal. So we always have parties of our team going to all the way to Switzerland to sit in on these cases. So we do have a very close working relationship with CAS. Senior Counsel Ahaga, what is your input on this? Um, well, certainly, um, Philip, I, I fully appreciate where Moses is coming from. Um, these are sometimes the shortcomings in the act. But having said that, the second schedule to our sports act specifically requires federations to subscribe to CAS policies and regulations. So there is reference to SCAS, there is acknowledgement of CAS. Um, the sports tribunal itself, in its rules, has made us an express provision for appeals from its decision to go to CAS. So appeals from the decisions of the sports tribunal actually go to CAS. Now, uh, that is in relation to uh, sports matters. In relation to doping violations, the Sports Tribunal has a very interesting structure. It hears first instance um, matters in relation to doping violations. It also has jurisdiction to hear appeals from its own decisions. So what I would ordinarily do is I would set up a panel to hear first instance matters. And if and insofar as they relate, let me say, what are called national level athletes. Now, international level athletes then have a direct right of appeal to CAS. Oh, yeah. National level athletes who want to appeal a decision of the sports tribunal, then have, a second, have an appeal to a, a separate panel of the sports disputes tribunal. So the sports disputes tribunal establishes an appellate panel to hear uh, appeals from decisions of a primary uh, panel. So uh, CAS jurisprudence, as Ian has, has said, is very important uh, to the workings of a sports tribunal. We subscribe to them. We, um, we, we have cited before us many, many decisions from, from CAS, as well as decisions from others, um, other uh, sporting bodies, sports resolution, uh, the New Zealand Sports um, Disputes Tribunal, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I would, I would, on the face of it, it may appear that there is no linkage with CAS, but the reality is that there is a, there are linkages starting with the federations and then onto the rules of the tribunal. Yeah. Uh, you need to be unmuted, Philip. All right. Moses still has another question on whether the panelists, on what's the panelists' view on whether Russia and Belarusian athletes should return in Paris 2024. 
because this has been a divisive issue. And maybe uh, senior counsel will come in first on whether Russian and Belarusian authorities should come in. And maybe Dave should also highlight on the position of uh, boxing at the 20, Paris 2024, because uh, there seems to be another controversy there as the IOC is consistent on saying we, ha we, we have banned boxing and yet the IF is also moving its way like we have recently seen that the IOC has its own qualifier system and the IF has also put up a boxing qualifier system. Thank you. Um, I would say that the stigma of state-sponsored doping is now behind uh, Russia. Um, I think that they have done their time, and I think that it is time to allow their athletes back into the global uh, sporting fraternity. Uh, I think the global sporting fraternity is poorer without the competition from, from Russia, especially in the field of events where Russia has specific um, expertise and, and, and ability. And I, I really, it is my view that Russia should be um, should be admitted back into Paris 2024. That's uh, that's my view. Of course, uh, there will be other views beyond the doping. Um, state sports are doping. I'm sure there will be those who talk about Ukraine and so on and so forth. But I think sports should be divorced from politics, um, and that athletes should be given the opportunity, uh, providing that they are clean to compete at the highest level. Uh, that promotes sport, and I think that they should be admitted. Yeah. Right, Philip. Um, <clears throat> I think leading off from where, where Mr. Aga spoke, the, the sporting fraternity when limited to uh, a pool of candidates is always going to be poorer. This is, this is something that we can put forward as an objective statement, right? Uh, sport is for all, it's designed for all. And despite some disparity that we may have, particularly now in this age where sport has become intertwined with commercialization and many other things, it is still for all. It's supposed to be accessible to, to, to everyone. So from that perspective alone, from that very narrow and utopian perspective, the fraternity is going to be poorer without Russian and Belarusian athletes or any other athletes indeed that are barred from partaking, so long as, of course, they are, that they're, they're clean and they comply with, with everything they need to from a wider perspective, both in terms of anything that they might have ingested and in terms of their whereabouts testing that they need to comply with. From the political perspective, you know, who am I, who am I as a as an Englishman of African, East African origin, uh, to, to make comment on, on this situation? I'm nobody. Uh, so from a political perspective, I understand that there are a number of different conflicting views. Uh, I think it's important for there to be an establishment of what is going to, to happen, whether it's to Russians, Belarusians, or, or anyone else, what is going to happen, why it's happening, and then ensuring that we have consistency across the border. If this is a politically motivated decision, uh, which we understand it to be, then right, okay, that's your prerogative as the IOC to, to do so on wait, what basis are you doing so? And are you then going to apply the same principles to to athletes from, from other jurisdictions, which from a sporting perspective would invariably worsen the, the pool. But from a political perspective, I think it's important that whatever happens, we have some uh, some consistency of, of application. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the things that most people around the world would, would like to, to have. From a boxing perspective, I don't sit as a spokesperson for the IBA. Uh, we're involved in, in boxing uh, and we do work quite closely with the IBA in several, on several projects, but I don't, I don't have the, 
the the capacity to sit as a spokesperson but what i what i can say is that boxing is one of the most traditional sports is something that has been um a staple of the modern olympics and was also yeah. something that was there in the ancient olympics as well as the the games in the golden ages boxing's been around uh, in some way shape or form for millennia uh, and it's not something that's going to go away uh, so uh, with respect to the IOC and the Olympic Games, uh, despite any disqualification of of boxing from the the wider from the, the the wider collection of games, it's not going to to dilute or to dispense with this discipline anytime soon. And in this sense, it's imperative that the IBA does continue to to put together its own pathway for for uh, for its athletes all around the world as well as keep a door open for when and I'm, I'm quite confident it will happen when the the relationship between the ioc and the iba thaws once again uh, because we need all of those athletes ready we can't like saying we can't turn commercialization on um overnight we can't all of a sudden say right the olympics is starting tomorrow iba is back in all of you guys have got to get fit uh, they've all got to be ready in in that case. So it's important that the IBA does continue on this pathway. And and look, they're doing a lot of a lot of work that is of benefit to many people. At the moment, they've got the the women's championships in India. They had the 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 championships in Morocco recently. They're going around the world and they're running a lot of tournaments. So uh, whilst there might be a political divide at present, I'm confident that the IBA will a be in a in a position where it's back in in good form with the olympics and and b when that does happen their athletes will be ready because they've been taking part in a number of tournaments accordingly thank you very much as we come to the end of this webinar session uh, more questions are coming in surprisingly but uh, i'm happy to see on call so many people from uh from uh in i see in-house council i see brenda is it I see Brenda Imelda, I see Brownie Ebal has been on call. I see people from Chigali and uh, Zanzibar. There's actually a question from Zanzibar from uh, from uh, March Niha, no, from uh, Jambia, who is part of the Professional Boxing Commission there, asking about how disputes that originate from Zanzibar are referred to CAS. I think there's also, Jambia should understand that there's sometimes a difference between the Professional Boxing Commission and the National Boxing Federation, uh, which is governed by the, the IOC, or the, sorry, the National Olympic Council. And under their charter, the disputes can go to CAS which may not be the case with a professional body. There was, uh, there's an inquiry from Nihal whether there is a regional treaty on sport that may not be in place, but I believe since the practice is developing, more and more players will be coming on board. We are coming to the end of this show, but as uh, the sports law committee, we promise that we shall have more interactive sessions on uh, on a periodical basis. And out of this session, I will ask that the secretariat secretariat engages our panelists to have an online introductory course in sports law, like we have so many uh, members can visit the ELS Institute website. The ELS website has a link to the institute. There are so many free courses actually like professional development oil and gas and many others i'll ask that sports is one of them because we have competent people the chairperson of this committee Noel, is herself a trainer in two sports she holds a master's she, she she has sports legal kenya which where i have studied from sports uh, as a certified sports mediator senior counsel here can also give us his experience from CIAB, I've done uh, an arbitration, an arbitration course. I've attended an arbitration course with them. So 
I think it is critical that we take this, this sector serious and engage members for the benefit of all, because sports practice seems to be one of the areas that is attracting so many players and interested people. Uh, the time is, uh, time is against us, but we shall have another interactive session. This session will be shared on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, members can also visit the uh, ELS social media handles on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and YouTube. Most of the sessions are shared there. I'm grateful for the panelists. Ian, thank you for that insight. And members can also visit the ADAC website for certain courses in, in anti-doping that will be helpful for them, to them. Uh, lastly, I thank the ELS members who are on call. Actually, it's Gabrielle for putting this together, um, Maureen, and so many others. I think we'll bring this session to an end in the interest of time. But Dave is always on call. Whenever we call on him, he's always ready to facilitate. Thank you, Dave. Senior Council, John Ohaga, uh, thank you for being part of this. I hope he's still on call. Uh, yes, Philip, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm all, it's always my pleasure to interact with members, uh, to listen in on courses offered, uh, sessions offered by the ELS. I find them very educative, uh, very enlightening and allows us to have reach across uh, the region, which is always very useful. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Council. Ian, your parting shots. Um, I just want to say I'd like to see more people in this field, the younger generation. There are very, very, very many opportunities for, to be taken up. And I just say, don't be afraid because I, I realize that it's a relatively it's still a, a new form of law that is coming up. And I can say that in a matter of time, it will be the place to be. So I just encourage get more people to come into the field. The opportunities are many. And uh, one thing I'd say is that the sports fraternity has a lot of, I've come across very many people, very, a lot of people who are helpful. So yeah. yeah, there's no, I feel like there's no gatekeeping and there's a, there's a sense of brotherhood and people are helping each other. So I encourage you because if you can see here, we are coming from different parts of the country, the world. So I encourage everyone to take up sports. Work. And uh, that's all for me. And thank you for include, uh, including me in this. Thank you. Thank you. I know we shall always reach out to you and you always be ready to serve. Uh, members, we, we have come to the end of this session, given our two hours of uh, interaction. We shall communicate when we have another, another session. Because I see members think they need to know more about this sector of the law. Thank you. We can live at pleasure. Thanks a lot, Philip. Thanks to all the participants. Have a good day. All right.